All I put in the trailer was flipping the singing studio using the striptease school of thought that if I just tantalize you a little, then perhaps as things get progressively revealed, it'll become more interesting. The idea behind this was just starting as a peripatetic singing teacher myself and also as a classroom singing teacher, I want to find better ways to teach my students. Back in 2019, when I did my independent study, I looked into what kinds of practice my students were doing and how long they were practicing for. And the conclusions I drew at the end of that study were that my students were not always aware of how to practice well. They knew there was such a thing as practicing well, and that was different from just singing through a song, but they didn't know how. So there may be benefits to explicitly teaching practice techniques and modeling those practice techniques in the lessons. All of my students needed better access to accompaniments at home so that they could practice more effectively. And without those accompaniments, very often they couldn't practice effectively at all. I found my students needed better memorization strategies so that they could memorize things faster. As when they did practice, most of their practice was in memorization and it was taking up a lot of their potential practice time. The aim of this 2021 study was to empower students to manage their own progress giving them the educational tools and guidance on how and when to use them so that they could become learners independent of me. If last time I was trying to find out what they practiced and how they practiced, this time it was for me to intervene and try to change their practice. So I had a 10 week intervention period, which happened to coincide with the start of the second national lockdown where I'm trying to teach students and I don't see my students to teach. That was a significant context. I started to do some research around the idea of lockdown as well because it was going to have such an impact. I found evidence that strict lockdown conditions negatively affect mental health and that music was widely used during lockdown in order to help regulate people's mood. It seemed to me then that alongside what I was doing, there was an urgent need for people to be singing during lockdown and that they had an unusual amount of leisure time to do that. I was just one of many singing teachers who was involved in online teaching with perhaps no clear idea of what good practice in online teaching looks like. So I decided to target my literature review onto what effective online teaching there was that could take that idea from my 29 study of how it would also help to promote independent learning in singing students. Flipped learning, and here we come back to our tantalizing word flipped, was one of the first things that I came across in my reading. The basic principle of flipped learning is that you do your classwork at home and you do your homework in class. Switch the traditional classroom structure around from traditional lecture style delivery of information to much more interactive activity. Change it from what I do as the teacher to what you do as the learner. Shift my role from the person who gives information to the person who facilitates learning and provides resources. Change the role of the students from people who turn up in order to gain the information to people who are the people who are actively getting information for themselves autonomously. If you look at Bloom's taxonomy on this uh, little tile there, if delivering information, getting students to remember it and getting them to understand it is the traditional role of the classroom, then in a flipped situation, the remembering and understanding part of learning goes over to them as pre-work before contact with the teacher so that then the contact with the teacher is spent on higher order thinking skills of applying and analyzing. And that works very well in an information rich curriculum where you give a lot of information, but we're singing teachers and the singing studio isn't a place where you deliver lots of information by lecture. So was this really necessary? Well, the context of lockdown and widespread home learning started to make it necessary because the normal work of the singing studio is really compromised when you're trying to do it online because of latency, because of audio quality. I reasoned that if you could move the process of learning the song to something the students do at home, the process of acquiring technique to something the students do at home, the process of developing oral skills and theory knowledge to something that they do for themselves, and then I, in our latency and bad audio quality uh, medium, can still be an effective coach to guide them to be more effective in their independent learning. 
that involves a paradigm shift for me from being the sage on the stage, I tell you the wisdom, to being the guide on the side, I show you how to get the wisdom. An online lesson, because you can't do simultaneous ensemble, I can't play the piano and accompany you singing. Effectively, the main role then of the online teacher becomes to provide feedback. It's important then to understand what good feedback is since we're doing so much of it. Good practice in feedback helps to clarify what good performance is. We do that all the time in the singing studio. It helps to facilitate the development of self-assessment. We probably do that in the singing studio. How did that go? What did you think? It encourages dialogue about learning. So you were learning it that way, had you considered that way, now you try it out, you show me and I'll give you some more feedback. It encourages motivational beliefs. We do a lot of that in the singing studio, I think universally. Perhaps at the bottom, that number seven may be the one that we do less of. Getting information from what you've just done that then helps me to understand what I need to teach you next time I see you. So that I prepare the lesson in advance because of what you've done. And the ideal for providing feedback is a dialogue between teacher feedback, student resubmitting their improved work, and potentially that going through many cycles. And the more that we can encourage students to close the feedback loop, I said do this, did you do it, let's see what effect it had, the better. That possibly happens a lot in the singing studio, but it can't happen a lot for the week in between lessons. And that's where the most valuable time could be spent. Second major concept I looked at was the concept of friction on practice. Uh, as an unrelated psychological study into this idea of friction, if you look at the American benefits system, there was a study done into do people claim their benefits? There's free money, do they get it? And the things which stood in the way of people just going and claiming free money were how complicated it was to do it, how much effort it took them, and how much initiative it took them. And the Begava and Manoli study found that when you could reduce the apparent complexity, reduce the effort required, reduce the initiative required, and send a reminder letter, the number of people who then took up their free money massively increased. These weren't real solid obstacles. These were just psychological obstacles. It made it a bit harder, and we use this metaphor of friction for how hard is it to do it. That suggests that students are significantly more likely to practice if the friction on practice is lower, if they have readily accessible notes of what to practice, readily accessible notes of how to practice, if they're given musically responsive recorded accompaniments for use at home, and if they can get feedback on what they're practicing at home, not in the lesson. In order to encourage them to practice, they all want to be better singers. They all understand that they need to practice. If you can just find the tipping point for that student, how much easier do I need to make it for you before you go, oh yeah, I'll do it. I looked at the issues of learning in lockdown during my literature review, and particularly the issues of ensemble and latency because they felt like such obstacles. The actual process is that you make a sound, it goes into the microphone, and then the computer has to do calculations to turn that sound into digital information. That's what your sound card does. If your computer's on Wi-Fi, the computer then has to do calculations to transform its information into microwave signal and send that to your router. That information's then got to be decoded to the router, it then goes through cables, and all along the international cable network, there are junctions called nodes. That's where your data queues. If there's a big bit of data coming down in an opposite direction, for example, somebody's Netflix streaming, which is paid for to have priority, then your video conference call waits for that priority traffic to pass. And the more of that there is going on, and one study found that during lockdown, people were watching about four times as much Netflix, for example, that meant that internet latency increased during lockdown. We had worse conditions. And then the same thing happens at the other end. All of those calculations take time, and that's what slows us down. The sound quality that we experience, well, we've got very small mics generally, which are picking up our students unless they've invested in something big. They're designed for speech, so they don't pick up the whole frequency range. It then goes through a system which is designed just to capture the essence of what you've said. 
So our video conference doesn't have the whole frequency range, it's compressing it. And then all that's going through there in internet speeds and things slow up and speed up and jerk a bit. That makes it really difficult to hear what the student's doing and then give them meaningful feedback. So some possible solutions were the asynchronous solutions. Instead of trying to do things in real time, what if we just don't attempt to do it in real time? Instead of me accompanying, what if I can send you a synthesized recording of the accompaniment or a live recorded accompaniment and you play it at your end where you can hear it in full audio quality without the internet slowing it down? What if when you want to sing to me for me to give you feedback, what if we don't do that over the internet? What if you record it, send me the recording, and then I hear that in full audio quality at my end to give you good quality feedback? And the same thing can be done with practice. What if we don't have our singing lesson in real time? What if I know what I want to teach you, and so I make a recording of the lesson that I want to teach you, and you watch that when you choose to? That's a key tool in flipped learning generally. The idea that you don't impart the information in the lesson, you might make a video recording where you impart the information which the students watch in their own time and then come to you with questions. This starts to look like an interesting junction between the problems of lockdown and the solution of flipped learning. Looked at different technologies which might be able to help reduce the friction on practice. If I want students to get good models of singing, YouTube has got, got lots of good models of singing. It's got lots of songs and demonstrations of how to learn them. And there are even lots of singing teachers who've already made those videos that I'm talking about where they demonstrate a technique. I possibly wouldn't even have to teach the lesson. I could tell the student, go to this video and they could get the information which we then discuss in class. The ability to take photos and videos of students or of me, the teacher, if I want to demonstrate something, take a quick video of me on your camera and then take that home and you've got that demonstration to keep. The same thing can happen on the internet. I can just take it and send it. And the same thing for what you as student are doing at home. If you want me to see a really good representation of you doing it, well, take a recording of it, then send me the recording. Smartphones can have apps and the potential for real-time visualization applications is really interesting. I don't have time for that on this project, but that's definitely somewhere what I want to look at. And then I also looked at the Google Suite. This was an important context because the school that I work in adopted the Google Suite, G Suite, for its use during lockdown for the delivery of all its classroom lessons. And it made a lot of sense that I, as a singing teacher in the same school, used the same system that the school was. That didn't occur to me during lockdown one, but it seemed the perfect solution during lockdown two. Google Classroom is a particularly useful tool, and I'm going to be referring to it quite a bit, but I don't have time to demonstrate it here. If you'd like to see more about it, then perhaps in the questions, that's something we can look through in detail. Having done all the reading, then it's time to design the study. I'm someone who believes in the existence of an observable reality. It's not always possible to complete, be completely objective about that reality, but it's still a worthwhile project. So a foundationalist ontology, a post-positivist epistemology. However, I wasn't interested in trying to prove, test or enumerate anything. What I was interested in, what was the learning experience going to be like for the students? So the research paradigm that I adopted was a social constructivist paradigm, quite unrelated to my own personal beliefs. It's about what I wanted to know, not what I already believed, which was important in my choice. My methodology was entirely qualitative then. It was a follow-up of a long-term action research project initiated two years ago. It was a case study of a convenient sample of my own students, and I used questionnaires in order to gather my data in partly controlled contexts. I'll explain that context later. Involving children, involving their parents, and involving other peripatetic teachers as peers for evaluation. In terms of ethics, I consulted with the head of the school, gained informed consent from parents because I was working with young people, briefed and debriefed the students, and I have a current DBS check, which was relevant for working with young people. My findings. My data was all in the form of responses to questionnaires about the technologies that we used in our singing lessons over the 10-week intervention. The participants in those questionnaires were the singing students, the parents of those students, 
and my peripatetic teacher colleagues. When it came to coding that data, I narrowed the focus of coding by taking the themes that had emerged from my literature review. And those themes were flipped learning, feedback as dialogue, reducing the friction on practice, and learning in lockdown. And anywhere in the data that those themes emerged, I highlighted those issues. However, I didn't want to prejudge the outcomes of my review. So I also then tried to broaden the focus of my coding by looking at frequency analysis and what frequently occurring words and what frequently occurring topics were there, which might actually lead my conclusions in a different direction from the themes that I've established from my literature review. That gives you a rough idea visually of the kinds of things that were emerging from the data. You can see an emphasis on the importance of video as a medium, the importance of recording, the importance of posting, and that's going to come to the social media aspect of Google Classroom. So when it came to using Google Classroom as a platform, which is a place that enables me to post lesson notes for the students to post any notes or questions, and enables, it's a place where I can post all of the resources in terms of accompaniments and song models and YouTube videos, and the students can comment back on those. And because it's all done under the aegis of the school through the students' emails, there are no safeguarding issues attached to that, as there would be in many social media platforms. The comments were that people felt that Google Classroom enabled things to be all in one place. It was integrated, seamless and easy. Because Google Classroom is more appealing to use than Dropbox, which is something we've experimented with, I'm more inclined to use it to practice and therefore get more benefit from it. The convenience and user-friendly nature of it, Google Classroom made the experience more enjoyable and seamless, and it partially relieves me of the burden of self-organization. You can see that student thinks that the friction has been lowered on practice. And a parent, uh, my participants, if there's a P, then that's a parent involved, uh, commented on one student, she did very little work previously between lessons. Now, as things are all in one place, she does more. When it came to the posts and assignments which were set on Google Classroom, having a list of the specific areas is a useful way of organising my practice, and it became a permanent record closer to the grade eight exam, I'll be able to look back over all my lesson notes. Student six used lesson summaries daily, uh, sorry, regularly between lessons to give me an idea as to which areas to focus on during practice. And one parent noted that posting assignments prompted practice. Some concerns emerged as well. One student said that using classroom makes it seem more serious and just like another lesson. And actually they liked the fact that singing lessons weren't like classroom lessons. All of the students and the parents in the course of their questionnaires volunteered unprompted by the questions that they preferred face-to-face -face lessons, despite the fact they were saying many positive things about the lockdown learning experience. It wasn't something I asked them about. All of them felt they wanted to say it. One said that they preferred aspects of non-digital learning, such as paper copies of schools and human accompaniments. And I think that reflects a general sense of people wanting to be humanly connected during lockdown. Capella School Reader was one of the devices that I used to make sure that students had accompaniments. It's a proprietary music processing, very much like Sibelius, um, but a bit cheaper, which helps me. And there's a free app that goes with it called Capella School Reader, which the students can download. And that means that any things I make in the music processing software, I can share with them. And then through Capella School Reader, they can play along, the cursor moves on screen, they can stop it, start it, transpose it, and change its speed. They liked the fact that they knew when to come in as they were following the score because the cursor gets to the right place. They liked the fact it was easy for them to start and stop and practice bits over and again, whereas with a backing track where you've only got the time reference, it was much harder for them to know where's the right place to come back in. They did note that it doesn't slow down for you like a live accompanist does and the sound can be quite mechanical. In terms of how independent the students were becoming, they said that they used the assigned interactive theory exercise to give them and sometimes still do, which I found quite promising. I practiced on my own. I found that using my devices made things much easier because I could use Capella School Reader. One said, I've used YouTube in between lessons to discover different interpretations. 
In terms of feedback on what the student practices at home, only one student really followed that through during the 10 week intervention. But she did say, the ability to comment on posts in Google Classroom has been especially useful for communicating about my choral scholarship recordings. There are comments right underneath the video, and it proved very useful in facilitating swift and direct communication between us about my choral scholarship recordings, therefore enabling me to learn from you and get your advice outside of official lesson time. Theoretical implications from this. Google Classroom as a platform definitely lowered the friction on practice. Modeling in lessons how I would practice and then writing it up and posting that can significantly raise the likelihood of students following it up with practice. Some student responses suggest that over-directing their practice can be demotivating and that judgments needed to find the optimum level of autonomy for each student. Teaching scientific detail of technique meant that motivated students could quite, be quite discriminating when they were selecting YouTube tutorial videos that they wanted to find to widen their knowledge. They could decide what was going to be a good lesson because they knew some of the technical background behind it. Then they came to me in lessons with questions. Why did they say do this? And they had an agenda of what they wanted to learn rather than coming to me as passive learners and waiting for me to tell them. When a student posted recordings from home in response to feedback, this started an iterative feedback cycle and the results were really impressive. Reflect on that. What I'd done was a small study of very limited generalizability. It only told me about the experience of those individuals. But that's what I want to know because they're the individuals that I work with. It felt important to keep people connected by singing. And so it felt like there was a moral imperative to do this. The unique conditions that we had with lockdown gave an opportunity for maybe a better than normal learning situation where isolation could be reframed as an opportunity for independence. Learning and teaching other people to use five different software platforms as part of this was very challenging and the school context where they were using them anyway was central to its success. Some students took digital exams from home. They returned from lockdown showing me songs that they'd been learning one had prepared for and passed a Cambridge Choral Scholarship audition, I've been thrilled with what they achieved without me, but in which I played a role facilitating as the guide on the side. The questionnaires generated a useful quantity and quality of data. The parent questionnaires required the students and their parents to talk together about what they'd done before either could fill the questionnaires in. And having this talk meant that they had a similar kind of context behind each answer session. And this discussion may have helped to scaffold better, more detailed responses from the students, as I often find talk does before writing in my English classroom. Professional development. In the course of a year, I've moved from never having taught a lesson online to a position where I feel confident to offer professional development training to colleagues. Back in 2019, my professional development plan from my research was that practice techniques should be explicitly taught and modelled in lessons. And that's where we are. Memorization techniques for lyrics and melody should be at the forefront of that, and that formed a desktop study I did. There was a need to develop self-accompanying skills on what I'd done with Capella School Reader and creating those files that supplied that need. I said my overarching aim would be to empower students to self-regulate their progress by giving them the educational tools and guidance on how and when to use them. And that neatly describes where I've arrived with the conclusion of this final MA project. There are still more things I want to learn. I'd love to make sure that the students' theory and oral skills are keeping pace with their technique, and that's something to explore. I would love to find out more about real-time visualization technology, in particular, the app Sing and See, partly developed by Jean Callahan, whose books Singing and Science probably many of you know. They're areas for interest for me. Thank you very much for going on that journey with me.